Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and if you're like me, you love the mountains, but you also love technology. I remember way back to when I first started working for K2 in 2000 when I had a Palm Pilot. I mainly used it to make bets on sketchy gambling sites so I wouldn't be too bored when I went on long drives to ski areas in the Poconos, which I seem to do every week. I never cashed in on any of my winnings, so I'm guessing I most likely lost a few hundred dollars on that Palm Pilot gambling escapades, but that was the start of my technology addiction. Fast forward a few years, and I get a job managing the K2 inline skate team. These were the days when to be a team manager, you had to have a portable DVD player, as my laptop was too bulky to have to pull out every time I got on an airplane, which seemed to be every week. And back then, I remember meeting a guy in the inline industry, a guy named Andy Critchlow. And Critch told me, in a pre-social media world, that he was leaving the inline business to take a job in the mobile phone industry. And he swore to me that, believe it or not, soon everyone would be watching TV and movies on their phone, people would be shopping. In his eyes, the mobile phone was the future. And this was like in 2003. And I hope Critch is rich these days, as he definitely saw the future before a lot of people. Anyways, I was blown away with his vision and I always tried to make sure that I had the best smartphone out. Eventually, I got the new iPhone, and it was game over. I was fully hooked on this tech, just like a lot of you. Now, most of us have some sort of phone addiction these days, and I've been pretty good about not getting hooked into TikTok, as I've seen how it captivates my wife and son for way too many hours. But I may as well be looking at TikTok these days too, as I recently started scrolling through Instagram reels, and I'm hooked on so much stupid shit that I didn't even know that I liked. I mean, fuck, I love watching raccoon videos. I like getting tours of strangers' apartments, hedgehogs, Frenchies, people fucking with their parents. I'm devouring all of it and watching less and less skiing and snowboarding stuff than ever. I start to wonder what's wrong with me, but then I get sucked into another totally dumb but captivating video. And then I watch these guys who look like they have nothing to their names or like begging for change. And when someone gives them a dollar bill, they're like, actually, I don't need that dollar bill. I'm going to give you $5,000. And there's so many people out there that are trying to make a difference in people's lives. And it's incredible to me. Like, how does this homeless looking guy have $5,000 to give the next 20 people that he sees? There's so many crazy things out there that's going on. And it's like, I want to do that. I want to be the guy who has the money to give every kid an Xbox and blow their fucking minds. But I don't know how these people have the money to do that. And while I was starting to feel bad about myself for spending so much time on my phone, I realized that there's something that's way more fun than scrolling. And that's actually doing shit where you don't need your phone. So I'm going to go night skiing at the summit at Stoquamie tomorrow night because it's important to remember what having real fun is all about. And real fun comes with consequences. Sometimes it's a thumb, sometimes it's a knee, and sometimes it's way worse. If you've been in this industry for a while, or you're just a hardcore skier or snowboarder, you've most likely known someone to have passed in the mountains. For a pro skier, like my guest this week, Adam Yu, That risk is increased by so many factors, and you can do everything right and still have an accident. On part two of my podcast with Adam, we finish up his life and times, and then we discuss the recent slide that took the lives of two skiers and left Adam Yu wondering why and how he made it out alive and unscathed. This is a heavy episode, and it's also one that everyone should listen to. Before we get into it, I want to ask you to tell a friend to listen to this episode as it's important that everyone hears a first-hand account of what can happen in the mountains. And when you tell a friend, you also help this show grow. I also want to ask you to support my amazing sponsors. They are Puffin Drinkware, Outdoor Research, Stanley, Elon Skis, Best Day Brewing, and Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Now, it's time for part two with Adam Yu. And it's just weird in the, in the terms of marketability of a skier, because when I think of like the most marketable or the one who sells the most product, I think about Seth Morrison. And Seth, if someone wanted to pay him right now, they could tell him, hey, man, you don't have to get a photo published or anything. Just let us say you're skiing on our skis. And he would sell that model of ski. People would go to the store and buy it. But it was never with you. It was like we were always going to get a shit ton of exposure. But it was never like Adam, you drove sales. There was like a weird disconnect there. I don't know if it was that we were marketing a younger person to the 40 and over crowd. 
But I mean, when you think about it, was there animosity towards K2 almost throughout your whole career because they never supported you like you should have been? It was one of those things where it felt like I couldn't ever do the right thing for the relationship. And I remember the one time I was invited to like the Easy Street photo shoot yep. at some point. And I was like, wow, okay, like they're paying for all these other athletes to come down for this photo shoot from all over the world. They won't even pay for my gas money. But I'm going to stand next to Seth Morrison in every photo taken just because I want to do that. Because they're going to use photos of Seth. Yeah. And I'm going to stand next to Seth in every fucking photo. So I did that. and It worked? I mean, I was in two-page spreads standing next to Seth. So that was pretty cool. And I was, of course, wearing my band t-shirt at the time. I was like, all right. That's Get awesome. I saw some free band advertising. But yeah, there was that sort of thing. And I never really understood why I didn't drive sales. But I also feel like, you know, it's kind of a chicken egg thing where maybe I could have if I was given opportunities or supported more. But you kind of let me do my own thing. You know, I was going to do my own thing anyways. And I think K2 was okay with that because they didn't have to do much. They knew I was going to produce. You were one of those super motivated guys. So we did know you were going to produce. You also had the whole marine biologist thing where it was like, you were earning income that you were putting right back into your skiing the next year, not to say that's the right thing to do. Maybe the brand should have been paying for it, but you were going to go on these trips regardless of what anybody said. You know, it was like, you're working all summer, you're going to save your money and plan your winter. And whether K2 was paying for it or not, you were going to go to Japan and, you know, you'd get some help from K2. So it seemed like you had another stream of income, which shouldn't factor into the team management part at all. But life isn't all mountains is kind of what I'm saying. And then Every summer, there's a hard stop for you and it's a 180 to get into like marine biologist mode. Is that a hard thing for you to do to go from like putting your life on the line in the mountains to then going and studying and researching? Not really. I mean, it wasn't that tough. Usually by the end of the ski season, like I was probably pretty tired. You know, I've been skiing a bunch. I've been doing a bunch of trips and I was ready to mix it up. I wanted to go spend some time on the water because, yeah, I love being on the water. I love being in the mountains. I love both. And it's like, well, I'm going to spend five, six months doing one thing. And then I'm going to switch gears and do five, six months doing the other thing. And how long a stretch would you be on a boat out in the ocean? Depends on the project. But like when I started doing NOAA research cruises, the first one I did was 120 days. Holy shit. But we would do like three weeks, you know, San Diego to Mazatlan was three weeks. And then we'd do two or three days in Mazatlan. Then we'd do three weeks at sea and go to... Acapulco and then we do you know, we, anyways you get days everywhere you're going to we do like three weeks at sea a couple days on land to recharge and you know refuel the boat reprovision the boat and then we go back out to sea for three weeks but yeah the whole trip was about 120 days and then with risk in the mountains there's some things that definitely scare you how about on the water do you get into any of those storms where you like really fear for your life <laughs> not really because like we're not deadliest catch style out there to make all the money and like get it while we can like we're scientists. And if the weather's too nasty to do our work, like we don't need to be there. Yeah. And we work for Noah, you know, so we are the weather people. We know what's coming (laughs) and we run screaming if we need to. Like we have definitely spent times like running from hurricanes or typhoons or whatever, because there's no reason for us to be out there. Right. So yeah, we keep it pretty chill. Yeah. There's absolutely zero reason to do anything stupid. No foolish heroics, if you please. Like we're just studying whales. Okay. We don't need to go out there and like, put ourselves at risk. Okay. I've looked through your blog and it looks like you guys have pulled all kinds of crazy shit out of the water. And there's lots of photos with bloody stuff that I'm sure you're just making dinner or doing whatever. But what's the weirdest thing that you've pulled out of the water? Oh, man. Well, I think like the bloody thing you're probably referring to is a dead kojia. I can't remember if it was a dwarf or a pygmy sperm whale, but we had come across this carcass of a freshly killed dwarf or pygmy, can't remember, sperm whale, which is like a 12 foot long, small tooth whale that some sharks were eating. We don't see this very often. So we we kind of lassoed its tail and dragged it up on the boat and did a full necropsy of this carcass. That was pretty sweet. I mean, we find glass balls and stuff like that, but that's pretty standard. I don't know. I've seen a lot of cool stuff out there. And then can you make any real money being a marine biologist? I mean, you're only doing it part time, it seems like you're doing it six months a year. But Is it one of those jobs where after you do it for a few years, six figures is reasonable for a marine biologist? Yeah, it kind of depends on what path you go. And like, I definitely could have made more money and had like a different career path if I had gone 100% on being a marine biologist. But I knew like, well, I don't want to be like a tenure track professor or uh, like work in a lab full time because I have the ski thing that I'm doing. 
So I had to kind of sacrifice a lot of that, you know, career path, you know, ivory tower or like climb the ladder type of stuff to maintain my ski existence. But yeah, I mean, you could if... If you were going full time. If I went full time, like, you know, if I was a federal scientist working for NOAA, like, I'm sure I'd be making a lot more money than I ever did. Like, let's think, if you didn't go into skiing like you did and you spent the past 10 years doing that, would you be making a couple hundred grand at this point? I mean, I'd probably have to have a PhD and it, it kind of depends because that scene is tough. I mean, like a level Seth Morrison level pro skiers, there's not a lot of positions for marine biologists out there. You know, there's only one director of a lab. There's only a couple heavy duty scientists, you know, and there's a bunch of sort of foot soldier style mid-level career folks. And like, I feel like I've mostly by choice stuck to that mid-level tier because I wanted to maintain. You want to be in the field. I want to be in the field. Yeah. I don't want to be in like a academic. I don't want to be an administrator. I remember talking with a bunch of my professional colleagues in the marine bio world, you know, oh, do I need to get a PhD? And like, oh, I don't know, man, you're skiing a ton. Like, I wish I was skiing when I was your age. Like, you know, you can go back to school later if you want. But, you know, if you can ski while you're young and healthy, like, if you can pull it off, maybe you should. And so I took that to heart and have been maintaining. And so far, so good. I mean, there's definitely some better years, some leaner years. But for the most part, I haven't defaulted on my mortgage yet. <laughs> and I guess you could probably say there's some better years and leaner years in the ski world as well. Because now you're on LibTech. Are you on any other brands? Yeah, I ski for. 11.8 Swedish clothing company. Okay. Zeal is helping pay the bills a little bit. Yeah. Backcountry access, lakey poles and gloves. And there's a couple other like, you know, 22 designs bindings and things like that. But, you know, I would never say that I'm like making a ton of money. No, I never no. have. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you think about it, how much is the most you've ever made from skiing in one year? Well, it was actually probably last year. Shockingly. Wow. But that was because I had a retainer to take photos for LibTech. Okay. But how about just being a pure skier? Oh, being a pure skier? Yeah. This is like, listen up, kids. It's a tough one. I don't think I ever made more than $10,000 a year. From no way. Skiing. Way. You're a guy who has seven covers a year and photo incentive wise, I mean, that's including photo incentive. You 10 grand a year is the most you made. So yeah, well, 10 grand a year might have been the most I ever made in one year. And the rest was a lot less than that. Yeah. So it's all passion. Yeah, it's you got to want it. Okay, so that kind of tells the kids what they can expect for a career in pro skiing, I would say average career, but in terms of exposure, arguably the most exposed American skier in the past 10 years, in terms of magazine coverage, so it's not a, a sport where you're going to make a lot of money compared to some of those other team sports. So I guess if you're born with a ton of God-given natural ability and you can take it somewhere, golf or do something like that. I mean, it's funny because I've been talking with a bunch of friends about this recently. And it's like, yeah, if you really want to like, ski every day, like definitely don't be a pro skier. Right. <laughs> no, if you want to ski every day in the winter, like my friends that are commercial fishermen or if you can handle it, like be a dentist or a real estate agent or something because skiing is, is expensive the only reason i'm still doing it at the level i'm doing it is because i have support from a lot of friends and you know brands that are making it happen if i had to pay for it all myself like it's not gonna happen yeah so this is kind of like i need to maintain this industry presence in order to maintain presence in the industry it's kind of like this weird relationship that i wouldn't be able to pull off any of it unless i was actively doing it and i, I was never the best skier ever that's very clear. Like I was never throwing down Seth Morris and stuff or anything like that. I look at what Sammy Carlson's doing now. And I'm like, yeah, uh, never. Right. And there's skiers around at Baker to this day that I'm like, yeah, you are a way gnarlier skier than I'm ever going to be or ever was. But if they don't have that work ethic to put the time in to get the photos, because that's a really important thing. If you want to generate content, you have to put the time in. Yep. You can't just be a rad skier and magically generate content. Well, it just doesn't happen. I mean, maybe it does now with social media and stuff like that, but and I never really understood how that works anyways. But uh, in my era, when you need to like show up in a magazine, you need to work with a photographer and you need to put the time and effort in. If you want to blow a beautiful sunny pow day making one turns, like it'll get you that photo incentive and you'll get those skis and the clothing and whatnot, but it might not make you rich until you make it to the Seth Morrison level or that level. Okay. Well... Before we get into the really heavy part of this podcast, I want to do a little story time. But before I ask you your favorite ski story, your favorite trip story, 
I'm going to bring up one that's kind of a rite of passage to every Mount Baker skier. Describe to me what happened 19 years ago at the Mount Baker Road Gap. (laughs) Yeah, about 19 years ago, around this time, mid-February, was the first and only time I ever hit the Mount Baker Road Gap. I remember going over there. Grant was there. We had a couple other friends getting ready to hit it up. And it was Grant's idea to air over the school buses because, you know, there's the weekend school bus crowd that comes up. And we thought that would be a really cool shot. And so I don't remember who built it. I don't think we did. But anyways, the road gap was set up. School buses are cruising down. And I remember, all right, you know, here we go. You know, I was nervous. It's a pretty significant piece of terrain and like iconic move. And yeah, I hit the gap and I made it across. Like my only goal was to not pack it into the wall or the road. And yep. Success there. I probably should have upped my game a little bit more and tried to land on my feet. But yeah, I destroyed the landing. Like massive, massive crater bomb hole. First and only time I've ever hit it. Photo's cool. You can see I'm like, ooh, he's backseat. Yeah, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't going to end well for him. But, you know, I'm not going to claim I was the first tele skier to hit it, but I don't know too many other people. I mean, Paul Kimbrough hit it later with far greater success and style than I ever did. Yeah, it was, it was a moment. And then when you think about your all-time best ski trip that you went on, If there is one, I mean, it's so easy to ask a question like that and you've gone on a million trips, but what's the one that stands out where you're like, man, it was just like everything lined up. Yeah. So I've been on a a lot of trips to a lot of different places. The one that is by far the life changingest one was our first trip to Japan in 2011. And that was one, yeah, again, Hattrip lined it up. I was still with K2 at the time and Hattrip lined it up, gave me some of his contacts over there that I'm still super close with to this day. Tanaka-san? Oh, well, it was actually Bill Ross. But Bill Ross introduced me to Tanaka-san and the whole K2 crew over there, who became, sadly, the, the, the K2 Washington crew was like less like family, whereas the K2 Japan people had my back and were awesome. But anyways, I met the K2 Japan folks, did a lot of work with the, the JNTO, National Tourism Organization of Japan. But yeah, that first trip blew my mind. I remember Grant and I, the very first day, our luggage didn't show up, so I'm borrowing some of Bill's, I can't remember what they were, like 80 and or foot touring K2 things, just getting maximum overhead shack, like never skied pow like that in my life ever. You know, I'm from Baker. I thought I'd have it all figured out. Yeah. No, Japan is a whole new world. The second day we were there skiing at Seki Onsen, it was like near death experience where I overshot the landing on a backflip and just plugged in upside down. And Casey Dean and Duncan Adams and Ian Foreman had to jump off the chair to dig me out. And it was like, oh, this is serious. This is an amazing, like serious place. You know, the food is epic. The terrain is, for me, for what I want out of my skiing experience, like Japan is my number one. Like I'd spent a whole bunch of years going to Europe before then. And since that first trip to Japan, I have not been back to the Alps since. If I'm going to do a trip, especially if I'm going to pay for it, I'm going to Japan. Like that is what I want for my skiing experience. I mean, I love Europe. Europe is great. I've spent a lot of time in Norway since then, but like I haven't been to the Alps since my first trip to Japan. And I think every photo that you see come late January, all through February from Japan, explains exactly why you and everyone else loves to be in Japan this time of year. I'm going to go on to the water side for a story from you. Have you ever encountered pirates, drug runners, poachers? What's the wildest thing you've seen with your own eyes? Okay. Again, I've seen a ton of stuff. It's kind of hard to think of something off the top of my head. I've gotten to be in the water with whales before. That's pretty cool. And that doesn't happen often, like only on it less than a handful of times in my life. But anytime I've been in the water with a massive creature, like a whale is, is pretty inspiring, like humbling. Like that is a big creature and it is smart and it is looking right at me. <laughs> oh my God, like, I feel very small. We've occasionally run across, if we're in the Caribbean or Gulf of Mexico, we might come across a bale of cocaine floating by, you know, like that's m- funny. Missed drop here and there. I've never been involved on one of these boats, but sometimes some of my colleagues have come across drifting pongas with Central American fishermen that are like, have been adrift for a week and they you know, save the, their lives type of stuff. That hasn't happened to me yet, but I've, you know, it happens. I mean, I see a lot of really cool stuff out there. I mean, I've seen half of all the species of whales on the planet, you know, which is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time with a lot of animals and that is something that is extremely special. I've taken biopsy samples from Many different species. Not many people I know have said that I've legally shot whales and I shoot whales for a living. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Oh, I actually, this is a funny story. I remember at one point we were chatting. I think we were talking with Sean Pettit. And in one of your uh, outros, you're talking about, well, I don't think anyone's ever actually been like 
rammed by a whale and i was like hey actually yeah you email me. I, I have been on a boat we got rammed by a sperm whale <laughs> so like that's the thing you know this is what happens on the open sea all kinds of stuff happen. you know sometimes it's super boring and the weather's rough and it's just horrible but then other times you have the most amazing experiences with nature that you can ever hope for it's time for my first sponsor break and i'm going to start things out with outdoor research I've been using OR products since I moved to Seattle in 2000 because I know they develop and test their products in the brutally wet weather that the Pacific Northwest always delivers. This means that my gear ensures that I'm always warm and dry, and that's the most important thing for me when I'm out there. But wait, there's more. Things have changed a lot since I first started wearing outdoor research gear. While they still use the best materials available, they've hired all new designers to create new fits that will catch your eye. And while OR still makes best-in-class mountaineering gear, it's not your dad's brand anymore. One look through their website and you'll see what I'm talking about. So whether you ski or snowboard, spend your time in the park, the backcountry, or the resort, OR has something for you. And I'm going to make it easier than ever for you to get your hands on some OR gear. When you head on over to OutdoorResearch.com, I'm going to get you 25% off of all non-sale items and you're not going to be able to use this code on OR Pro products as well. And that's more their military stuff, so you don't really need to worry about that. But use the code POWELL25. That's all capitals for the word Powell, no spaces, and then the numbers 25, and you're going to get that discount from OR. My next sponsor is Elon Skis, and I'm in love with both my Ripstix 106 Black Edition and my Ripstix 96 Black Edition. They are so fun and lively, all while remaining light and stable. And I'm not the only person who thinks these skis ski better than the competition. Both of these skis were named the Editor's Pick in Free Skiers Magazine Test this year. And combined, Elon won over 65 awards in 2022. Great products is why you're seeing more Elon skis on the hill. And making you a better skier is how they've been building a cult following here in the U.S. But what's really amazing about the brand is that they built a solar power plant on top of their state-of-the-art factory. Which means Elon is powered by renewable energy. They've also shortened the supply chain. And now 70% of Elon's materials come from within 250 miles of their factory. And the innovative digital printing technology they're using has already saved 32 tons of volatile waste since 2016. To find out more about all things Elon, head on over to elonskis.com. My final sponsor is Stanley, another iconic Seattle brand that has been ahead of the curve since 1913. While we all know Stanley for creating that iconic green bottle that kept your grandfather's coffee hot all day long, Stanley still does that and a lot more these days. And Stanley has always been the right choice when it comes to the planet. Even before we were talking about saving the planet, Stanley was ahead of the game with their reusable water bottle that is still popular today. If you are still using single-use plastics for your beverages, it's time to make a change, and I'm making it easier than ever to save 30% on all products from Stanley. All you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, buy some stuff, when you check out, you're going to want to enter the code DRINKFAST. That's all lowercase. That's all one word. And you're going to save 30% when you put that code in there. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Now we're going to jump into the heaviest part of this podcast. You were recently on a photo trip with Kyle Smain and Grant Gunderson to Japan. It's pretty standard stuff for what you do. The trip is pretty much over. You guys are going to do a fun lap. So you dig a pit. Things look good. And that's pretty much standard for you. Snow safety is something that you've been about ever since I've known you. So snow safety wise, you've always been looking to minimize risk and be smarter. You're no cowboys out there, right? That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, as I've gotten older, especially, you know, when I was younger and dumber, like we're all young and dumb when we're young and dumb. And then hopefully we get smarter before we get killed. <laughs> and, you know, again, that's where the mentors come into play and things like that. But yeah, you know, as you start losing friends to the mountains, like we've all lost a ton of friends at this point. Like I have toned it way back in my risk tolerance. And I'm very happy to meadow skip all day, every day, if that's what's on the agenda. Yeah. And I would think the first person that you lose that's super close to you in the mountains, would that be Carl when he passed? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was in South America. I wasn't with him at the time, but we actually had been chatting about linking up while we were down there. He was on a trip with Renee and I was down there on the end of a fun ski trip. And actually I got home and it was Ken Sheely, K2 wow. engineer, who I had just gotten home and he's like, oh, did you hear the news? Like, what news? I had just gotten off like a horse packing trip. I've been out of connection for a week. So did you hear the news? Oh my God, yeah. Carl Skoog passed away in a ski mountaineering accident. And that was like, oh shit. 
I mean, that's like one of your best friends. Yeah, he's one of my best friends. He's one of my mentors. He's like, I don't know, father figure, mentor, whatever. But he was like an extremely important person in my life at that time. And I remember just like, holy shit. Okay. What does this mean? Did that change everything for you? It didn't change everything, but it was a huge eye opener because at that point I hadn't really lost anyone that important. I mean, I'd lost friends and whatever, but it was, he was like, yeah, by far the first major, like, it's not all peaches and cream and pow skiing and, you know, smiles and high fives. There's consequence and there's danger and it's, it's very real. So you learned that early on, but in this trip that just happens a couple of weeks ago, everything looks good. You guys take that first lap. Grant heads in because it's been like a, a long trip and he's pretty beat. And you're going to meet up with him when you guys get back on your second lap. And why don't you take the story from here? Because I don't need to fill these words. Yeah, it was like the last day of our ski trip. We had already been working for about 10 days or so. And like the day before was an amazing, amazing, like the day you look for on any trip. It was like 50 CMs a new. It was epically super rad. Grant was crushing the photos. Kyle was crushing the photos. Tatsuya was killing it. I was on a snowboard, which is kind of funny. Grant was like, <laughs> what are you doing? We'd be getting way more bangers if you were on the skis. And I was like, well, I'm learning how to snowboard. This is the first trip I've ever brought a snowboard to Japan. And I have a million photos of me trenching through Japan pal on skis. And I know my level of connection is going to be far less epic if I'm on a snowboard. But I want to have that one banger photo of me on a snowboard in Japan, because who knows when I'm going to have a chance to shoot with Grant in Japan when I'm on a snowboard. And a lot of the articles, or some of the articles, called you Snowboarder Adam Yu. Which I think is hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, that's been a, a new thing for me. Anyways, yeah, we were having a great time. That day before was like the best day, and we knew that we're not going to top that. Let's just go out for our last day and have fun. Grant didn't even have his camera gear with him. Like, I always carry my little camera with me, and Kyle had his, like, you know, POV stuff and whatnot. But it was just a fun day. We had no professional ambitions to like get the shot or anything like that. We just wanted to go ski and it was a beautiful day. Yep. Yeah. So we were out touring above Sugaike and Hakaba Valley. We run into Edge, Bruce Edgerly. Like I knew he was into, oh, Edge, what's up? You know, this is like. Like on the skin track? Yeah, on the skin track. I knew he was there. I knew he was around. We have been chatting around, but I didn't think I was going to run into him. But right. Like, oh, dude, Edge, like buddy. We ran into another friend, Mark Lasseter on the top of the gondola who we hadn't seen in 10 years. It was just like a really cool, small world, happy moments happening all morning. Yeah, we go up to this line that I had skied a few years, uh, probably seven years before and ski it. We, yeah, we, we were like, we were concerned, you know, there was, we knew that there was an ice layer down there and we had been tracking it throughout our whole trip. We, you know, we identified some zones and we're like, okay, you know, red flag that, red flag that, red flag that. Nope, nope, nope. And like, what about this? Like, this is the one section of this piece of terrain that, you know, I've skied it before. If you're going to go somewhere, like this is the stepping out line, the first line you would ski on this piece. And yeah, we dug a pit right on the start zone and it was 10 CMs on top of that ice layer. Like that's manageable. And we, you know, we dug down another meter. And it's like all solid uniform block. And I'm, I'm not going to claim I'm some sort of snow science expert by any means. Like I've spent a lot of time out there. I definitely have a lot of respect and a lot of fear, especially when I'm in places that I don't know, like the back of my hand. Yep. But at that point, we weren't worried about the line that we were going to ski. So, you know, we did our things and we talked about it, whatever. Long story short, we ski it once. It's amazing. I'm on my snowboard. Amazing. And we go back up. And yeah, Gunderson is tired because, you know, he's been carrying his 50 pound camera pack for the last 10 days every day. And so like he goes down to the bottom, you know, I'll wait for you guys at the bottom with beers and ramen. We'll be hanging out. High fives. So anyways, we say goodbye to Grant and then Kyle. And I go back up for a second lap. And Kyle was a frother. I don't know. Like, I'd actually never met him before this trip. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know him. But I've been on a lot of trips with a lot of people over the years. And there are definitely times when I've been on trips with people that I wanted to kill myself. Like, oh my God, this person is so annoying. I will strangle you. Right. And I've been on trips with people like Kyle who are like, oh my God, I want to spend more time in the mountains with this guy. He is the most positive dude I've ever met. And I'm not just saying that because he's moved on. I mean, I heard that from everyone. Yeah, he's like the legitimately raddest dude. Just saying how much he loves skiing every day. Every day, every run, he'd be like, oh, I love skiing so much. The skiing is so cool. Like, the skiing is the shit. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it really is. And at this point, let's put it this way, I'm like kind of at the twilight of my effective career as like an athlete. And I'm like, you know, I've had my jaded moments and I'm like, I want to spend more time with this guy because like his positivity is really 
kind of what I need right now yeah. to like keep me motivated and like it is cool what we're doing like I yeah you know, yeah there's a lot of bullshit that I got to deal with like people don't understand like oh I'm only making like eight grand a year from all of my sponsors combined and like that's not enough and you know I'm putting myself out there and it's, anyways all those like negative swirly thoughts hanging out with Kyle they're all gone and it's just like yes it's all high fives it's all so fun this is so rad like I want to go on more trips with this guy yeah so anyways we we totally hit it off it was super rad. Then we go up for another lap and we run into this through uh, Austrians. And it turns out that like Kyle knows, you know, they, they have mutual friends and it turns out I have mutual friends with these, you know, it's like the classic small world. Like if you're in the community, the global skier, snowboarder community of the type that will go to Japan or go to Europe or, you know, makes it their life priority. Mm -hmm. You're probably only one, maybe two people away from everyone else in that same community. It's like the Kevin Bacon game. Yeah. But it's like, there's one person separating you. Versus six. Yeah. And it's it's super cool. Like, we can be on the top of some random mountain in Japan, Kyle and I, and we run into these three Austrians that we've never met before, and we have mutual buddies. Like, oh, I was at that guy's wedding. Like, oh, all this cool <laughs> stuff. Like, whatever. And that's, like, the coolest thing about the snow community to me is the, the fact that it is a community, and it's a global community, and it's super tight. Yep. So anyways, we say hi. We discuss our snow pit, and we play the name game. We take some photos. Whatever. Hanging out. and then. Kyle and I ski the same line we skied before and get to our stopping spot, which is like 500 meters down in the flats, like below the mountain where we had transitioned before. And then the Austrians drop in. The first guy joins us. And then the second guy drops in and there's this massive avalanche that I remember I was taking photos with my little camera at the time. And I remember like, oh man, like, wow. Like we heard the crack and I could see it kind of through my viewfinder. And I'm like, oh shit avalanche and Christoph gets on his radio and he's calling up to Ludwig who's skiing down he's like oh you know avalanche get out of the way get out of the way and I remember yelling go go left go left go left and I'm, at some point I remember thinking wow that's actually like bigger than I thought it was like it's way bigger than I thought we should probably move and we were literally 15 feet away from the uphill part of the skin track where we would have been completely fine but like we're yeah maybe we should move like we should move and I remember putting my camera in my pack, grabbing my pack and kind of like running through knee deep, flat pow, you know, Japan deep pow. Yeah. And I remember grabbing my pack because I was thinking like, I need to have my gear because we're going to need to dig that guy out. He's fucked. It still never occurred to me that like we would be fucked because we were so far away. Yeah. So like, I don't think I made it more than a few steps, maybe. And I look over my shoulder and there's this massive wall of snow. It's like right there moving really fast. And then I get knocked over and then I'm like, Oh, shit. So no time to react. Oh, I mean, I actually just got the video that Christoph had taken on his phone. And it was 21 seconds from the crack to us getting hit. Okay. In the first 10 seconds, you're kind of just... We're like, up. dude, that's like, oh, get out of the way. Like, we're just kind of like processing it. Yeah. And then, yeah, maybe it was like the last eight seconds before I get hit where I was like, wait a minute. Ooh, <laughs> this is more significant than, I, than we thought. And so I remember like I started running across the fall line towards like the uphill part of the skin track where we would have been fine. When we were all standing, like this guy, Christoph, who we just met, and Kyle and I were in high five range. We we're just literally standing in the flats in high five range. Yeah. Just so stoked that we had just skied this rad run. It was so great. It was beautiful. Like Kyle and I were like, that was sick. And we're gonna meet Grant now, go have beers and cheers and high fives and we'll go to Tokyo and party it up and have a great time. And we're we're done. That was literally the last run of the trip. But anyways. So I try and get across to the skin track up and out and I get hit and I see Kyle's off to my left hand side. He had kind of like started going more like down the fall line. And I remember like I had this like lizard brain ancient memory of like the Conrad anchor Alex Lowe, David Bridges, Shisha Pangma avalanche mm -hmm. where Conrad ran across the fall line and got out and the other guys kind of ran down the slide path and got clobbered. Right. You're not going to outrun an avalanche. Yeah. You might run out of the path, and that's kind of what I was thinking, but I, I literally only made it two steps, you know, between having that thought and getting clobbered. And then I remember, like, oh, shit. I remember having a few thoughts, like, I never thought this was going to happen to me, but here I am. Like, I remember trying to stand up as soon as I got knocked over, and that was definitely not happening. I remember trying to hulk. So I felt two waves of snow, kind of like the first initial wave that knocked me over, and then a second wave kind of come over me, and I was like, okay, this sucks. Let me just hulk out of this, like beefcake my way out of the slide. Uh -huh. 
Did not happen. Could not move. Like, oh, you're cemented. I'm like fully stuck. I was able to move the right fingertips of my right, you know, my right hand, like just open and close my fingertips. So I was like, oh, I can do that. I started scratching at the snow and then I realized quickly that this is not the move. Like I'm not going to dig myself out with my fingertips. Right. And this is all happening within like nanosecond. It seemed to me anyways, that it was happening in very quick, you know, instant nanosecond thoughts of like, Hulk out. No. Freak out. No. You know, don't panic. Dig out with my fingertips. No, that's not going to work. And I remember, again, as this is all happening, like kind of in disbelief that it was had happened and thinking, okay, having my entire mind go like, well, everything has become very simple now. I wasn't torn up or like twisted or I was just knocked over and buried with a ton of pillows. So it wasn't like I was smashed or twisted or injured. And I was just knocked over and immobilized, like very immobilized. And I remember thinking, okay, well, there's at least one more Austrian up there. There are people around, like I know Edge is around somewhere, you know, there's people around. We're in like a relatively busy backcountry zone. So I know there are people around. I know my transceiver works because I've tested it three times today. And I know I'm going to get dug up. I just don't know if I'm going to be alive or dead at this point. So the only thing I can do, like I could panic, but that's not going to work. I could try and struggle. That's not going to work. Like that's not going to work. The only thing I can do is just chill. Like I need to power down everything and buy myself as much time as possible and just not use any extra energy. And like, I'm not any sort of like meditative guru or anything like that. And I was very thankful, you know, lucky that I didn't have any injuries or it wasn't like torn up. And I didn't have any snow in my airway. I definitely couldn't take like normal breaths. I was like hyperventilating. I don't remember even being squeezed. I just remember it was like trying to breathe through like a tiny paper bag. Okay. There was not a lot of breath happening. You know, I could breathe poorly, extremely poorly. I remember hyperventilating, like, you know, but not getting what I needed. So I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. Hyperventilating is not going to work. I need to just power down and lower my heart rate and lower my respiratory rate and just fucking chill. Like nothing else matters. I cannot think of anything. Yeah, I had one non-burial related thought. It was like, I hope I make it to this movie date when I get home. Nope, can't think about that. I, I really, I, you know, I'll either make it or I won't, but I can't waste any time or energy on that. I just need to, you know, power down and chill. So your life's not flashing before your no, eyes or anything No, and that was like an that. interesting thing. Like, you know, you hear about your life flashing before yeah. your eyes and all this sort of stuff. I never saw the light or anything like that. I was just like, nope. I got full focus on nothing. I didn't think of my family or my friends. I had that, like I said, one nanosecond micro thought of movie date and then realized that that was useless energy. And I was like, I need to just chill the fuck out and not think about anything. I need to just lower my heart rate, lower my respiratory rate. Like, so I'm taking these really poor breaths, so I need to make sure that they are getting as much as they can and I'm not panicking. So I, yeah, I've never done this before in my life. Hopefully I'll never do it again. Yeah. But nothing else mattered at that point and just powered down. And I'm like, well, I'm going to get dug up one way or another. I knew that there was nothing I could do. My life had become so simple. I had no options. Like option implies I have a choice. I had two possible outcomes and I acknowledged those outcomes as either I'm going to get dug up alive or I'm going to get dug up dead. And I can't do anything about it. I don't need to fret about it because I've never been to that phase of existence before. Nothing has ever been that clear cutly binary live, die. It was weird. <laughs> I don't recommend it. No. <laughs> I mean, and you were under for like 20, 20 minutes. 25 minutes, according to the guys that got me out. Usually, if you're under for more than 15 minutes, it's, it's like, over. Yeah. And I remember being like, okay, I'm just going to power down. And like, I'm accepting. That was one of the things that I was surprised by, especially as I've had time to reflect on it. I was like, I was kind of surprised that I wasn't like more pissed off because I can definitely get pissed off about things that piss me off. Like, I'm not like some sort of saint or whatever. I, I'll get mad. But I wasn't even mad. I was like, well, you know, this happened. I'm now buried. Yes, it totally sucks, but I can't do anything about it. So I acknowledge the fact that it sucks. Move on. Let me try and stay alive. And I acknowledge the fact that I may or may not die here. And if I die, like I'm, I don't like I'm okay with it. I'm definitely not okay with it, but I have to accept that that's an outcome that very likely will happen. And yeah, it was super, you know, I talked to my therapist about this a lot. I would think, yeah, that yeah, there's a lot is, of therapy. This is going to be unpacked for years. For the rest of my life, I'll never have answers. 
Yeah. But yeah, it was just like a weird kind of like, I accept what has happened. They eventually get to you and they dig you out. And then when they finally get you out, are you another person for a little while trying to figure out what happened? Or are you Adam, you and just kind of in shock? So yeah, I'm in my powered down state. And I remember thinking, I'm either going to get dug up dead or alive. And it's going to be either dead or some unknown cavalry is going to come get me. All right, power down, just wait for whatever happens. Is it going to be sleepy time forever or the unknown cavalry is going to come and just, okay, sleep mode. I don't remember ever losing consciousness. And it felt like not very long after I kind of had that whole like power down process, I felt the probe strike. I remember distinctly thinking, fucking A, cavalry came. (laughs) Was not expecting that. You know, honestly, I wasn't expecting that. But, you know, I, I snapped out of my sleep mode and they're like, I got this now. This is rad. Fuck yeah. Sweet. They're digging me out. This is going to be so cool. And they got to my feet first. They started, and I was buried head down, face down, about a meter and a half. So they're digging me out. And they free my right hand. And apparently, I immediately started throwing them shakas and thumbs up, which completely baffled them because they were expecting me to be dead. Right. Because it had been you know, a massive slide and all the things. But yeah, so I'm waving at them. I'm throwing them shakas. And I hear these muffled voices. Like, I'm like, yeah, dude, I got this. I got this. Like, I just got to hold on. I'm good. Like, I'm good. This worked. And they were yelling at me to stop waving my hand because I was interfering with their digging, which I know I was just so stoked that I was being dug out. Like, woo! Yeah. And they get me up out of the hole. And I remember thinking it's going to be like some Japanese mountain rescue squad or something like that. You know, I knew where I was. I was completely lucid. And I remember looking up out of my hole and there's this old white guy with a red helmet, Grateful Dead sticker on it, like steal your face on his helmet. And I was just like, what? who is this guy? And like, Jerry? No, like it, <laughs> but it was just so, who are you? Like, I wasn't sure who I was expecting, but I was not expecting the first thing I saw to be like a Grateful Dead sticker. Right. Which was <laughs> kind of cool, like I gotta say. So like they dig me up and, you know, I look around, like I don't recognize anybody there. They're doing CPR on Kristoff behind me and he's, he's not looking good. And I'm like, oh, like this is a bad bad scene and I ask him how long I've been down for and like, yeah you were down for 25 minutes like what no it felt like four four or five minutes at most but apparently it's 25 minutes and yeah you know they to keep me warm and you know, gave me some tea put me in some puffy coats and baby sack and things like that but I'm like conversing with them and then I know who I am I know where I am I know what happened I'm like where's Kyle oh he didn't make it okay that's bad like this Austrian guy that I didn't even know his name at the time yeah I just met him minutes before He's not looking good. Kyle's over there. He's not looking good. Like this other guy coming down, he's got a shoulder all bunged up. And then the third Austrian, you know, she's coming down. She's okay. She's hugging me to keep me warm. The other deadhead is keeping me warm. And we're just like chatting. And at some point, I talked about this with the uh, rescuers later. So it turns out, again, small world, ski world. The rescuers are two Canadian guides who are friends of friends, like, of course. And then there are uh, six clients who are all like ER docs and medical professionals. The dream team, if you're ever going to have a catastrophic situation like this go down, you want to have this hyper pro, hyper trained, extremely competent crew of eight ready to dig you up. Yep. So you couldn't script that. That's about as miracle as you get. Right. But that's what I was thinking. I remember having that thought in my head of you know, the Pulp Fiction scene, you know, where they're, you know, picking up Marvin and... They- you know, the guy comes out of the bathroom and shoots and like, this was a miracle and I want you to acknowledge it. In the scene, like I'm standing in my meter and a half deep hole. I've just been like ripped out of the earth and this is a miracle. I don't know any other way to describe it. Thinking about Pulp Fiction. Like, yeah. How did this happen? You know, it's not like I dodged six bullets. I dodged a nuclear bomb and the guys that were standing literally within high five range were killed and I walked away without a scratch. Like I lost a contact lens and that was it. That is so lucky. It's super, and it's like, I'll never understand. This is something I will take to my grave whenever that shows up. I guess it wasn't my time there, but I'll never understand. I'll never understand. I don't think I did anything special. Like, yeah, I thought about running across, but like, we got smoked immediately. I didn't make it any farther than those guys did. I don't know why they got killed and I did not. That'll never make any sense to me. So actually, I've talked with a bunch of people since this, like my therapist, as well as a whole bunch of people like Elise Sogstad, we talked with her for a long time. I remember thinking about her at the scene 
it's like, ooh, I should give Elise a call because she's probably one of the few people I know that's like been through something similar to this. Yeah, and understands Creek. some of the thoughts. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to need to outsource some of this. I've never been here before. Like, I feel like I've had this like rebirth opportunity, but I don't know what it means. Like, I don't know how it's going to go. I mean, that was only two and a half weeks ago. I know. It's so and crazy. I'm, like, I'm still processing. I'll be processing forever. And you know, I will say it has been an amazingly positive experience coming home. Like, I'm obviously super bummed. Like, Kyle, my new best friend, passed away right in front of my face. Yeah. And this other guy who I just met, who turns out, like, could have easily been my new best friend if I had had more than two minutes to hang out with him, passed away in front of my face. And I somehow made it. I've been talking with their family members and the community around here has been so supportive. Like, oh my God, like, we can't believe we're so glad you're back. I'm like, I am too. This is amazing. Like, I did not ever imagine the support would rally so much. And it's like, it's super humbling and amazingly powerful. And like, I don't want to waste it, but it's hard to like, it's, yeah, I mean, hopefully none of the listeners will ever have to go through this. I'm sure some of you will at some point, because that's what happens in the mountains. But like, this is a roller coaster that I am just getting on. <laughs> yeah. And there's so much for you to unpack. And there's a couple other questions I, I guess I have to ask just because we're talking about it now. So all this shit goes down. In the hours after it, are you guys the ones that have to make the phone calls to friends and family? Because as tough as what you've just gone through is, it's still so new to you that you probably haven't processed it all. And then you have to tell other people. I can't even imagine how difficult that is. Yeah, uh, that's definitely the worst phone call that Grant and I, I mean, we made that phone call together and I don't think that'll ever be topped in the uh, worst phone calls ever made ever. Yeah, it's horrible, but you got to do it. And then are you responsible for the logistics of getting Kyle home too? Because it's not just like your friend passes your trips over and you go home. There's a lot of shit to figure out in a short period of time. Yeah, so that, that really ruined our two days of partying in Tokyo. I can imagine. We yeah. ended up, instead of that, having like high fives and cheers and beers. Although Kyle didn't drink that much, so it would have been high fives and cheers and whatever. But anyways, yeah, we spent a lot of time in like the police investigation and police report and you know that sort of stuff. So the day after was a nightmare of just logisticking and trying to get the translations of what happened. And we're talking to the, the police, Japanese police. And I, I know they mean well, but man, who that was like. If Bill, our old friend Bill Ross, hadn't been there translating, like I probably would be in jail for assaulting a Japanese police officer. I was so pissed off. Like they put us in this freezing cold room to do this interrogation, investigation, you know, police report process. And I remember telling, I was so mad. Like they had four heaters on the wall that weren't working, and they're trying to figure it out. I was like, I'm colder in this room right now than I was on that mountain. Like, put us in a different room or turn those things on. Like an hour later, they figure it out, and it's just, oh my god, you know. So there's no compassion for what you just went through. Yeah. And again, I don't know if this is their procedure or what, but it's kind of been my experience in Japan over the years, even when like nobody dies. You know, if there's a little wild card, like they have bullet trains and everything works and the electronics are on point. But like if there's any sort of weird wild card or like variable, the wheels completely fall off the program. And like, wait a minute, but you said you were going to do this and then you're doing this instead. Like you were going to go to the Sugai K, but you know, you're at Cortina, we didn't have the tickets lined up. And like, oh my God, it's this huge chaos fest. And when you add the death of two skiers to that wild card land, the procedure just, they're scrambling and they're trying to get the paperwork dialed in. It was not as efficient as you would hope it would be or compassionate or anything like that. And at some point they're like, you know, you just have to have patience. Like I used up all my patience in that fucking mountain for 25 minutes, apparently. That patience is gone. Like, I'm just happy to be alive now. I don't have any more patience left for this process. Like, I'm happy to be a part of it. I'm happy to be alive. But man, don't push me. I am very feisty. Like, yeah. I, there's a lot going on in here. I've literally just got unburied 12 hours ago. And they're asking me all these questions. And like, oh my God. Ugh. And then we had to go yeah, identify Kyle's body, which is also really horrible. Yeah. Eventually, we were able to kind of pass off all the logistics to like embassy level stuff. And we were then, you know, free to go and do our thing which was go home. Thank God. Like, oh my God. You know, I usually am not psyched when I have to leave Japan, but this was very exciting. Get me out of here. I want to just go home and lie on my own bed and 
start processing because I didn't really have a chance at like Grant and I were over there going like a full autopilot trying to logistic yeah. everything and like police reports and get passports and all this sort of stuff and like what happened da, 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 da. and like if we didn't have Bill there or the guy Kenji who was a former Baker snowboard dude used to work at SnowCon huh. and I didn't know him but he walked into the interrogation room like they had asked him to help translate and he walked in wearing a Mount Baker hat and I was like oh my god you get it you're the my stars boy stars have aligned because otherwise, we're talking to some like Japanese cop who doesn't know about avalanches, and we're trying to explain to him what happened in this lost in translation mess. And then this dude walks in that he's got a Grateful Dead sticker on the back of his Land Cruiser, and he's got a Mount Baker hat on, and, and I'm like, okay, you're my person. I can talk to you. I know that you get it, and like, you're my boy. Again, mountain community comes together to save the day when all is lost. It's time for my second round of sponsors. And I'm going to start things off with Best Day Brewing. I just received a case of the newest Best Day flavor, the Hazy IPA. And in about a sip, it became my new favorite beer from Best Day. The Kolsch is now a close number two. And for those of you that don't know what Best Day is, think of NA beer that tastes even better than an alcoholic version. And the best part is, it won't slow you down. Now, I still drink alcoholic beer. But these days, between picking up my kid, running errands, and just living life, it's nice to have a non-alcoholic choice. You know, to drink a beer that won't get me in trouble. That's what Best Day is for me. It's the smart choice that's full of flavor, and at under 60 calories, I know I'm not going to pack on the weight like I did with alcoholic brews, and without the alcohol, I'm not going to feel like crap the morning after. So, next time you're at the store, support the show by grabbing a six-pack of Best Day. And if you can't find it at your local grocer, Head on over to bestday.com. Orders of over $50 get free shipping. My next sponsor is Puffin Drinkware. And if you don't know Puffin, well, you're missing out because a drink without a Puffin just isn't the same. So now you're probably asking yourself, what's a Puffin? And I'm going to tell you. It's personality-infused beverage apparel. Think stylish clothing for your drink that uses insulation technology with a thermal liner for colder sips to the very last drop. You're going to be the hit of any party or gathering with a Puffin. And with silhouettes ranging from hoodies to spacesuits to ski patroller outfits to life jackets, your drink will never look cooler or cuter. Everyone needs at least one Puffin because they will put a smile on your face every time you look down at your drink. And Puffin is going to make that easier than ever for you to do. They're going to save you 20% off all Puffin orders. And all you need to do is go shopping at PuffinDrinkware.com. And when you head to checkout, enter the code Powell Movement. That's all lowercase, all one word, no spaces and you will save 20% off your Puffin drinkware, and you will have the cutest drinkware in the entire planet. My final sponsor is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Peter Glenn has been the best-in-class one-stop shop for all your ski needs since 1958, and your snowboard needs since the sport started. The reason why is because in-store, Peter Glenn has a knowledgeable staff to help you get the perfect setup at one of their many locations. But I get it. You may not be able to make it to a Peter Glenn store, and that's okay. Peter Glenn has a best-in-class online shopping experience over at peterglenn.com. The site has all the brands, all the products, and they offer free shipping on orders of $49 or more, a no-hassle return policy, and they price match any reputable shop on the web. So if you find a product for cheaper at a reputable Peter Glenn competitor, Peter Glenn will match that price. Please do that every time you shop, because when you do, it gives Peter Glenn more of a reason to continue to support some cool things in snow, like this podcast, Johnny Mosley, and a lot more. So please support the brand that supports me, and check out Peter Glenn before you buy something anywhere else. Those are my sponsors. Now it's time to jump back into the podcast. I am so sorry that you had to go through that whole thing, man, and I don't wish that on anyone, obviously. It's the, the biggest thing that we fear in the mountains, and you had to experience it. I'm glad you're here to do this podcast and just be alive and live your life. I feel so sorry for Kyle's friends, family, and anybody that knew him. And it just sucks that he's lost and it's not fair. And it's really not fair for me to end this podcast with something like this that is such a downer. So I have to do something to kind of spin it into a more positive light and very hard to do after it's like the most negative, saddest thing that I've ever had on the podcast. But I am able to do something that's called inappropriate questions. This is where I get someone to ask you three questions and they can be anything. And it was really tough to get people to ask you questions. Everybody's like, hey, Adam, you's in a bad place right now. I don't know if I want to ask Adam you questions. And I totally understand that. But I was able to get 
one of my favorite people in the entire industry. I'm going to guess he's one of your favorite people in the entire industry as well to ask you questions. This guy runs everything outdoors for K2 right now, but you know him as the BCA guy forever. He's got one of the greatest personalities in snow and he jams guitar with you all the time. I'm talking about Steve Christie. And are you ready for three inappropriate questions from Steve? All right. In the band Metamucil from Glacier, Washington, in their top 10 hit, Sleaze Porch, please fill in the blanks. I blanked, 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 friend, on the Sleaze Porch. All right, fill in the blanks there. Okay, yeah, so this is our Metal Musil, Metal Musil, with umlaut over the U for, you know, Spinal Tap. Yeah. The crew. My last name. Why not? Uh, yeah, Sleaze Porch was a song that the late Scott Peterson and I wrote about sketchy ski town local dogs that are just trying to have empty beer cans and dirty sofas on their sleaze porches and trying to pick up chicks at the bar type of thing. And I can't remember the exact lyrics what he was going for, but I'm sure there was lyrics that involved like, I'll feed your roofies, then fill your boobies on my sleaze porch. It's on Spotify. No, it's not. It's on a band camp somewhere, Metal Musil. Bandcamp. You can find it. You can listen to it. All proceeds go to the Coal Pad Skate Park. If you feel like buying it, it's free download. It's ancient history from Adam's musical archives. So that was a band that was together for a couple years. I believe it broke up some internal conflict within the band that happens to groups. What was the biggest show that Metal Musil ever played? Oh yeah, Metal Musil. We played only ever in Glacier. We played in Bellingham a couple times. We played at, I think it was Jim Jack's Memorial in uh, Leavenworth. But yeah, some of our biggest parties, we've played Tex Davenport's Garage a couple times. Some house parties that got out of hand. We played at Graham's a couple times. St. Patrick's Day at Graham's in 2012, I think. One of the few times I've been like, this building may collapse with us (laughs) raging in it because we were raging so hard. But yeah, we, we succumbed to band drama. All right, so that is question number one. We're gonna jump into question number two. Okay, Adam, in the 1990s, the early 90s, you saw what appeared to be an obese homeless man in sweatpants at the grocery store, bending over with his butt crack sticking out, trying to get a carton of cigarettes out of a locked case. Can you provide a little bit more detail on who that was and your impression of the situation? Yeah, this is a classic Marin, you know, growing up in Marin with all these famous people floating around. I was tasked with going to the grocery store to get like the last item we needed for dinner. And it was my turn and I didn't want to go, oh, okay, I'll go, I have to go. So I went to the local grocery store and was in the express lane and there was a locked cigarette case and there was this dude that was not looking hot. And I was like, man, this guy is a total bum, super skid, like, yeah, disheveled, black sweatpants, dirty running shoes. Like this guy is pathetic on his hands and knees trying to open this locked cigarette case that's clearly locked. And the, the checker gal comes over and is like, excuse me, sir, can I help you? And he stands up and he looks at me and I'm like, huh, who is this guy? He's like this like mad scientist looking white haired dude. And I'm like, huh, funny. He looks at me, he looks at my shirt and he kind of chuckles. And I realized, oh my God, that's Jerry Garcia. I can't believe the guy that's on my shirt <laughs> is a bum. I thought he was a bum. And he's like, I'm standing there, I'm like 16 or 17 years old with my whatever item I had, a cauliflower or a can of tomatoes or whatever it was, I don't even remember, but I'm sitting there like my guitar hero of all time, you know, like holy, it's either him or James Hetfield, but like these guys, like my local musical hero is standing in front of me chuckling because I have his likeness on my t-shirt and I think he's a bum and oh my God, like holy crap. And then the checker gal comes over and he gets his cigarettes and he leaves. I'm standing there like a total idiot, just stunned in the, in the line. Like I cannot believe I saw Jerry Garcia in the supermarket and I thought he was a bum, (laughs) but he was doing kind of bummy stuff. It was, you know, it was a bad time for him. It was probably the heroin. Yeah, yeah, it was like, it was in, yes, spring of 95. It was in between Vegas and Shoreline because I went to go see the dead a couple days later and, you know, he still wasn't in fine form, but at least it was in context. Right. So I remember being like, dude, I can't believe it. Go home and tell me, Liz, I saw Jerry Garcia in the supermarket. I'm like, God, it's crazy. I mean, not often that you run into your guitar hero and you think he's someone else. No, that is pretty incredible. And we'll go with his final inappropriate question. 
This one is going to be a quick one, and let's play it up right now. If you had to kill one type of whale, what would it be? If I had to kill one type of whale... Oh, man, I don't like killing whales. Well, I think that's why he asked the question. Yeah. And he was going to draw it out with some like long thing because he just threw that out there. I'm like, no, the way you just said it, that's the way we're going to pose okay. this question to him. Maybe he's referring to one of my favorite T-shirts of all time, which is a Norwegian pro whaling shirt that has a Norwegian flag on the front. And it says, we kill whales for fun. And on the back, it has a picture of a harpooned whale bleeding everywhere. And it says only 86,999 to go. I wear that on occasion. I think it's you know, kind of funny given right. my line of work. But I've had some personal near-death experiences from like angry Sea Shepherd types that, you know, because I used to live in Friday Harbor and that's where Sea Shepherd was based at the time and they might still be there. But I remember walking down the street wearing my We Kill Wells for Fun shirt and having very feisty Sea Shepherd people come and like almost have assault in the street. Adam gets his ass kicked by feisty whale huggers who are like, no, it's kind of ironic. You don't understand. Like, don't kill me. It's a joke. <laughs> But they're like, oh, no, they're very, they're, they get feisty, you know, they take offense to this shirt. But yeah, I don't think I would like to kill any whales. No, but if you had to. If I had to kill a whale, like for whatever reason, I don't know why I would have to do this, but I would say that gray whales are super cool, but they're pretty much at carrying capacity, at least in the, the Eastern Pacific. So they could lose a whale and not have a greater issue with the population. That's a pretty nerdy response. You know, a common dolphin, there are many, many, many thousands of them, tens, hundreds of that. There's, you know, you're not going to miss one. And I wouldn't kill a vaquita. There's only a, a handful left. I wouldn't kill a southern resident killer whale. There's only a few left. But, you know, some of the more common, less depleted whales, you know, if I had to kill one, I'd kill one of those. All right. But we know that you would never kill a whale. I'd never kill a whale. Because you love whales. They're so fun. whales. But that's inappropriate questions. And that is our podcast. And your life is so interesting because you have two dream jobs. Given one doesn't pay shit, it might not be a job. It's more a volunteer position. And neither does the other one. <laughs> yeah. But there are two dream jobs. I mean, there's a million sorority girls everywhere saying, I want to be a marine biologist. And but that doesn't even really get what you do. But it's, it's funny, I think, in that respect, that there is a stereotype of someone who wants to be a marine biologist, but you are actually what a marine biologist is. But it's amazing that you've been able to figure out how to do both things and do both things that you're passionate about. And while you make pennies on the dollar, it seems like with what you do, you have a beautiful house here in Deming, Washington. You're 30 minutes from the ski resort and you get to live and play with exactly what you want to do. And not too many people can say that. So I thank you for inviting me to your compound. I'm sorry that you had to go through all the shit that you've had to go through and you're still here. I'm still here. I'm still breathing. Uh, I'm still hustling. Like, yeah, two dream jobs that take a lot of work, time, effort, energy. But yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way at this point. I'm really happy I get to keep doing it at this point. I wasn't sure a couple weeks ago if it was going to keep going. So definitely a newfound appreciation for everything. Like looking outside and seeing birds, petting the neighbor's dogs, all the cool stuff. All the shitty stuff that I still get to do because I'm still breathing is really, really cool. So that was time with Adam Yu. And man, we are so lucky to have that guy with us. Listening to his whole power down mentality makes me wonder what I would do in that situation. I'm sure I'd start out by burning a lot of energy panicking and freaking out. But after hearing what Adam did, I'd then try to power down and wait for the cavalry to come and rescue me. Adam was so lucky, and two others weren't, and that's what's so scary about the mountains. You never know exactly what's going to happen, and you can be so prepared and have so much avalanche training, but really, you are at the mercy of the mountains. Mother Nature is a powerful beast, and she takes what she wants at different times. But I will say that this is part of the game for a pro skier. It's like the risk for me as a podcaster is me pissing somebody off that I'm interviewing to the point where they beat the living shit out of me. I accept that risk as part of my job. And I have had one athlete who really did want to beat the shit out of me. Luckily, I don't think he can get to me right now. But unfortunately for the pro skier, the risk in their lives are dying in an avalanche. That's on the bingo card of things that could happen when you're a pro. So I'm so sorry to Kyle Smain and his friends and family. I feel terrible for your loved ones. And while I know that you'd rather be here today, I do find comfort in knowing that you lived more than almost any of us ever will. That doesn't make things any easier, but it's true. And for the Austrian that we lost, well, I'm ashamed that I don't even know your name. I'm sorry for your friends and family, and I wish you were here as well. That's the podcast. 
And while I'm at it, I need to give a shout out to one of the dudes I grew up with and I lived with while I was in Vail, Colorado. Greg Tafe passed away this week. If you knew Greg, you knew his wickedly funny and inappropriate sense of humor. And man, that guy loved to party. He was such a good time. And I'm really sorry to Greg that we drifted apart over the years. I hope you're finally in a happy place. I'll miss you and all of your stupid prank calls and antics. No one did it better or worse than you, Greg. I'll also pray for your daughter, Ashley. That's the show. I'm not going to read a review of the week as none were good or bad enough. So when you review me on iTunes, please make sure you write something that I'll laugh about or I'll get pissed about so I'll read it on the show. Because good or bad, I will read them if they're well written enough. And if I do read yours on the show, you do get a custom limited edition Powell Movement something. I've been sending out puffin drinkware and people have been really loving them. So that's what you have to look forward to. Finally, please support the brands that make this show happen. They are Puffin Drinkware, Outdoor Research, Stanley, Elon Skis, Best Day Brewing, and Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Have a great week, everyone.